Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على سلاح حي على سلاح حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar La ilaha illallah <coughs> rahman rahim The name of Allah, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعود بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدل فلا هدي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وده لا شريك له وأن محمد نبيه ورسوله. Unquestionably, the perfect praise belongs to Allah. We praise him. We seek his aid. We seek his forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and our own bad deeds. Whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whosoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I openly bear witness that there is no God, no deity, nothing worthy of worship except Allah, the one having no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. Rabbish rahli sadri wa sadli amri wahlatu ukta tamili sani yef kahu kauli. O my Lord, expand my chest for me. Make my task easy for me. Remove the impediment from my tongue so they may understand what I say. Allah tells us in the Quran, Audu bin. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله تقا تكاته ولا تموتون إلا وأنتم مسلمون. O you who believe, regard your duty to Allah in truth as it should be regarded, and do not die except in a state of full submission as a Muslim. We thank Allah for this day of Juma. We thank Allah for waking us for the best day of the week. We thank Allah for another opportunity, another breath to show our gratitude to him for making us Muslim. It is indeed a mercy and a blessing from Allah al-Malik, the sovereign Lord, the one with the complete dominion, the one whose dominion is clear from imperfection. And we pray and we strive so perhaps others are guided to this mercy and this blessing called Al-Islam. Brothers and sisters, we know that smiling is a sadaqa, it's a charity. But what about the frown? What about frowning? What does the Quran, the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet, the Uswa, the example of the Prophet say about frowning? The word abasa, it appears in the Quran two times. 
another derivative a third time, which is related to the harshness of the hell fire. But Abasa, to frown, appears in the Quran twice. And in both instances, the same man is involved. In this khutbah, inshallah, I want to share the stories of Abasa, frowning, and the opposing courses that one can take in this life. The person who is present in both instances, when Allah Ta'ala mentions frowning, is a man named Al-Walid ibn Mughiyya. Al-Walid was the chief of the Banu Makhzum clan of the Quraysh tribe. The Banu Makhzum was a wealthy tribe of Quraysh, and he himself, Al-Walid, was a very wealthy man. He had land, he had property, he had gardens that they said stretched from the city of Mecca all the way to the city of Taif. They estimated that his wealth was 10 million dinar. In today's dollars would be 33 million dollars. So he was a very wealthy man. He was the father of the famous enemy of Islam who turned Sahaba, Khalid ibn al-Walid. Allah says in the Quran, the Meccans said about this man, Al-Walid, they said, why wasn't this Quran sent down to great men? To great men in the two cities. What they meant was, one of them was Al-Walid, because he had so much money. They wanted to know why did the, why did the Quran come to this merchant instead of to, him, to someone like Al-Walid. He was a mushrik. He believed in many gods. And he was threatened by the tawheed or the oneness of Allah that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was preaching. Remember that these gods, in quotations, had statues. And these statues brought great wealth to those merchants, those people who sold them. And an unseen Allah that has no partners, has no parents, or has no children, puts an end to this selling, to this commerce. So the Quraysh leaders assemble so they can stop this Islam stuff. The Prophet was under the protection of his uncle, Abu Talib. So Walid and others, Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl, the father of ignorance, Epta, they all came to Abu Talib to get Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to stop insulting their gods. Brothers and sisters, I want you to remember that la ilaha illallah is provocative. It is a direct denunciation of all other gods except Allah. He, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we are saying that all other gods are imaginary, are fictitious are not real except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are offering to make Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam malik, to make him king of the Arabs, of the Quraysh. Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam turned down this kingdom. That speaks to his character and his sincerity. Because if you're lying, you take this kingship, right? They also offered him beautiful women. If he abandoned this mission of preaching of Al Islam. To this our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also declined. Riches, a kingdom, and beautiful women. Any dishonest man would have taken any one of them, let alone all three. But according to his sirah, according to his biography, Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam says, by Allah, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I will never, never abandon this mission. So Walid and the others had to devise another plan. So they went to Abu Talib, his uncle. And Al-Walid, this wealthy man, this man of prestige, offered his own son to Abu Talib. His son's name was Umar. Walid said, he is the strongest and most handsome man of the Quraysh. Take him, adopt him as your son, and give us your nephew. 
who is opposing your religion and the religion of your forefathers and severing the unity between the people. He's mocking our way of life. So let us kill him and take my son. A man for a man is what he was offering. Alhamdulillah, Abu Talib refused. So some time had passed and Al-Walid heard Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam reciting the Quran. The first three ayahs or verses of Surah 4, which, which, which read, or which are said, Hamim tanzil kitabi min Allahi azizul alim ghafir dhab that dan bi wa qalihi tawbi shadeed al iqabi bi tali la illaha illa huwa ilay absir. The revelation that is being recited says, Ha me. The revelation, this book is from Allah, the Almighty, the All Knowing, the forgiver of sin, the acceptor of repentance the severe in punishment and infinite in bounty. There is no God except him. To him is our final return. And I am telling you, brothers and sisters, just the hearing the Quran, the recitation, affects people. So this recitation affected Walid greatly. Walid went back to the Quraysh people and said, what a great thing this is that I have heard from Ibn Abi Qabshah. That's what he called Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa An offensive name. The Quraysh had named him. Meaning he was the son of the rebellious one who goes against his people. So he called him an offensive name. While still saying that he heard something great. He says, by Allah I've heard such a speech from him as I have never heard speech from any other man or jinn. He said it had sweetness and elegance. He said its upper part is fruit bearing and the lower part causes water to flow. Its beauty no doubt surpasses the beauty of all other speech and, that can, and cannot be superseded. It is not the speech of a human being is what Al-Walid said. He said, I swear by Allah, this is not poetry. This is not magic, nor the babbling of an insane person. Verily, his speech is from the words of Allah, is what Al-Walid said when he heard three verses of the Quran. So he insulted the prophet by calling him, calling him an offensive name, but also admitted that the Quran is from Allah to Allah. Of course, he is confronted by the Quraysh who are saying the Quran, when he says the Quran is from Allah, and then he has to change his tune. Brothers and sisters, this is what kufar means. It means knowing the truth, recognizing the truth, but then covering it, hiding it, and denying it. Allah Ta'ala reveals in the Quran in Surah 74, Ayahs 11 to 25, what happens next? Allah says to Muhammad, and leave to me the one who I've created all by myself, this human being. And I granted him abundant wealth and children always by his side and made his life easy for him. Yet he hungers for more. Remember Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam said about the sons of Adam, they will never ever be satisfied until their mouth is filled with sand. That means we will always want material gain up until we die. He has everything that he can ask for and he wants more. Allah continues, but no, for he has been stubbornly against our revelations. I will make his feet unbearable for him. For he thought and he plotted. May he be condemned even more. How evil was it that he determined? Then he looked around, talking about Al-Walid. Then frowned and scowled. Then turned back on the truth and acted arrogantly, saying, This Quran is nothing but magic from the ancients. 
We seek refuge with the love from those who lie, those who conceal the truth. May we never be in this path or in this way. Despite accepting Al-Quran as the word of Allah, he concocted a lie to Allah, to the Quran, calling it magic and calling our prophet a magician. Why? Why did he have this change of heart? Why did he change his tune? When the Quraysh heard about this great wealthy Arab leader and what he had to say, it created an uproar because they were thinking if he accepts Al-Islam, then they will, the other Quraysh will be inclined to accept it, accept it as well. Now we have to think about the wealthy people, the LeBron James, the Oprah Winfrey's, the Jeff Bezos. If they accepted Al-Islam, other people, just because they're rich and wealthy or in high esteem, they'll follow in his footsteps. And that's what the Quraysh were thinking. They were concerned about this. But Abu Jahl, which means the father of ignorance, he tried to calm them down. He said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of this. I'll solve this problem. So Abu Jahl goes to Wali and sits next to him and pretends to be sad, pretends to be crying. Wali says, what's the matter? Why are you crying? Abu Jahl replies, the Quraysh decided to collect money for you to help you in your old age. They learned that you visited Muhammad and Abu Bakr so that you may get some food to eat since you praised their speech. This was a complete and utter lie. The Quraysh did not collect money for Walid. The lie was invented for Walid to get upset, and it worked. Walid was highly enraged when hearing this. In his anger and his arrogance, he says, how can the Quraysh correct, collect money for me? He swore, he swore by his gods. He said, I am not in need of food. In fact, I got more money than all of them. That's what he said. But then his cognitive dissonance started bothering him. So on the one hand, he's arrogant, but the other hand, he heard that Quran. He's trying to figure out, how can I gel the two? So he talks to Abu Jahl. He says, when you talk about Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa and you say he is insane, have you ever known him to do anything that's insane? Abu Jahl said, no. He said, you claim that he's a psychic. Have you ever known to do anything him do to do anything like a psychic? Abu Jahl said, no. He said, you tell people he's a poet. Have you ever heard him doing poetry? Abu Jahl said, no. He said, you tell people he is a liar. Have you ever, ever known him to tell a lie? Abu Jahl said, no. He even called him a soothsayer. He said, have you ever known him to do anything like a soothsayer? Now Abu Jahl has to go back on the lie that he has told, but he still wants Al-Walid to turn back on what he said about the Quran. So he says to him, well, tell me, you tell me what you want me to tell the people that you think about Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Walid starts to think about the people and how they saw him and what they would say about him, accepting this deen. Then he raised his eyes towards Abu Jahl, Abbasah, frowning in a hateful manner, and ultimately replied, I think he's a magician. Walid then knew that Muhammad was not a magician, but he still wanted to tell people this, to devise an excuse for what he had in his mind. He says, do you see how his speech, how his recitation separates husband from wife, brothers from brothers, fathers from sons. This is definitely the effects of magic. As soon as the people accept this deen, they begin to dislike their unbelieving mothers and fathers and relatives. Walid decided that day to suppress the truth in his own mind and lie to the people, lying to himself about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the Quran, and how both of them affected him. Because of his disbelief, because of his covering of the truth, Allah Ta'ala promised him the hellfire. He was one of the Quraysh that also offered to worship Allah one year and worship the, his other guys the other year. One day while Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was circumambulating the Kaaba, Walid and his group of leaders came to him. 
again offering him wealthy, which riches, wealth, and women. And again, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam declined. What well, they say? Well, if you don't want to take wealth, position, position, and women, how about this? We worship Allah for one year, and for the next year, you worship our gods. To this, Allah Taala sent down the Surah Al Kafirun, saying, "Ku ya ayuh al kafirun la abidu ma tapudun, wa la antum abidu ma abud, wa la antum abidu ma abatum, wa la antum abidu ma abud, la kum dinu kum waliyadin," which is translated, "Say." O oh, disbelievers, I do not worship what you worship, nor do you worship what I worship. I will never worship what you worship, nor will you worship what I worship. To you be your way, to me be mine. Let us stop now when that's love. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sabihi wa man wala ajma'in The perfect praise belongs to Allah The guardian evolver of all systems of knowledge May Allah's blessings and peace be bestowed upon our noble leader Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Upon his family upon his companions, upon his followers, all of us, all together, all over this world. May our duas be for those in Libya, in Morocco, in Palestine, in Sudan, all over the world where Muslims are facing hardships, where people who are oppressed are facing hardships, whoever they are, whatever they believe. Now, back to this story. There was a time when Muhammad, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was talking again to this man, Al-Walid, trying to convince him to accept Al-Islam. Now, I just ended the first part of this football with La Kum Dinukum, to you be your way, to me be my way. Some people use this as an excuse not to give da'wah. But Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam offered him Al-Islam, invited him to Al-Islam, and then when he was restraining against it and trying to change Al-Islam, that's when he said, to you be your way, to me be my way. So you don't just start off with you be your way, me be my way, right? We do have to invite people to this way of life. So the Prophet is giving him doubt. Al-Walid is considered again this great man of the people, and the Prophet is trying to convince him to accept this deen. Because if he brings him, other Meccans will follow. And a believer approaches him. Abbasa wa tawala. He frowned, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He frowned and turned his tension away. This is in Surah 80, the first ayah. He frowned and turned away. And it continues, simply because the blind man came to him interrupted. You never, you never know, O oh prophet, perhaps he was to be purified. Or he may be mindful, benefiting from the reminder. As to those who regard themselves as self-sufficient, meaning Walid, the person that the prophet is talking to, you gave him your undivided attention. This is Allah talking to him. Even though you are not to blame if he would not be purified. Meaning if he didn't accept this, then it's not on you. But you're more concerned with him than with the believer who came to you. But as to the one who came to you eager to learn, being in awe of Allah, you were inattentive to him. But know the revelation is truly a reminder. So let whoever wills be mindful of it. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shunned the believer who was eager to learn for a disbelieving, lying mushri. And Allah admonished him for this immediately. And that is recorded in the Quran. Think about this, brothers and sisters, for a moment. 
a liar would never put this in the Quran. Even an honest person might not. Memorializing his chastisement from his Lord for eternity. One would only record this incident if it was a revelation from Allah. The blind believer that interrupted him, his name was Muhammad, was, I'm sorry, his name was Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. After this incident, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always addressed him as welcome to him who, whose account my rub, my sustainer, has rebuked me. The Prophet was grateful to him for being a means of correction from Allah Ta'ala. Abdullah was blind and did not even know that the Prophet was annoyed by him. Allah made a distinction that time between him, Abdullah, the servant, the believer, and this wealthy man. The blind man, the believer, was in the highest station, not the wealthy man. This is in the eyes of Allah Ta'ala. And Allah sent Jibreel to rectify the situation immediately. By the way, before I continue about Abdullah, this blind man, let me remind you that Al-Wali, his sons and his daughters became Sahaba or became spouses of the Sahaba. So while he was trying so hard, so desperately to destroy Al-Islam, Al-Islam was all in his house. Even with his lies and schemes, Allah's plan will prevail with you or without you. As for Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum was born blind. His mother was called Umm Maktoum, meaning the mother of the concealed one of the one with the sealed eyes. Abdullah was the cousin of Lady Khadijah, Muhammad's wife. He was among the first to be converted to Al-Islam. And when, and when before the Hijra, before the Muslims made Hijra to Medina, Abdullah was sent to the Medinans to teach. This is what esteem and knowledge this man had. Also, you may not know this, but Bilal radiallahu anhu was not the only muadhin. Abdullah was. And they would change. They would, they would switch sometimes. Sometimes Abdullah would call the ikama and Bilal would do the adhan and vice versa. And Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam, when he went to battle, Abdullah would be the person that was in charge to, give, to lead the prayers. He gave the cookbooks. This same man, because we only know about him being shunned. We need to know about this man, this Sahaba, and how important he was to this deen. To, to a, so important that Allah Ta'ala revealed a verse about him, admonishing our Prophet. So after the Battle of Badr, the Prophet receives a revelation from Allah Ta'ala, raising the status of the Mujahideen saying that they are preferable over those people who are inactive in their homes. So those who are fighting for the cause of Allah, Allah says they are raised to a higher level than those people who stay home. This is in order to raise the, the esteem and encourage the mujahideen, the fighters, and to maybe get those people who stay at home to come out and fight. So initially, the verse read, or the translation was, those who stay at home are not equal to those who strive in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives. Allah has elevated and ranked those who strive with their wealth and their lives above those who stay behind. Allah has promised each a fine reward. So both of them will get a reward, but those who strive will receive a far better reward than others. Son, we'll look at brother. Can you come up here? You can sit right here. <clears throat> So when this revelation came, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, called Zaid, radiallahu anhu, and commanded him to write down this verse. But this revelation affected Abdullah the blind man deeply. He was pained that he couldn't be a part of the Mujahideen. He wanted to that strongly to be in the middle of the fight. He said, O messenger of Allah, I would be in battle if I could. He then earnestly prayed to Allah, 
asking Allah to send down a revelation about this particular matter for those people who are disabled and unable to fight in battle. The same man that was covered by Allah Ta'ala from this frowning asked Allah for another revelation to cover him and Allah Ta'ala answered it. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abdullah Radiallahu Anhu were sitting right beside each other or right across from each other. And Abdullah says, Allah Ta'ala sent down the revelation to his messenger while his thigh was on mine. And it was so heavy for me that I feared my thigh would be broken. That's what happened when the prophet received revelation. He had great strain on him, great pain on him. And he was just in contact with Abdullah's thigh. And the pain ended when the revelation came Except those who are disabled. His prayers were answered. An additional phrase was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to distinguish between those people who are disabled in battle. So the revelation, the ayah reads now, those who stay at home, except for those who are disabled, are not equal to those who strive in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives. Alhamdulillah. But still, but still, in spite of being excused from fighting, Abdullah still wanted to fight beside his brothers in battle. This is the, this is the character of the Sahaba. He figured out a way to do so. He said, place me in between the two rows and give me the standard. Give me the flag. I'll hold it. I'll protect it. He said, look, I can't run. I'm blind. So in the fourth year, after the Hijrah, Umar radiallahu anhu brought the fight to the Persians. He said to his governors, send me weapons, send me men, send me horses, and anything that you can to help right now. And the forces met, and they engaged in battle for three days. And the fighting was amongst the most fierce and the most bitter in Muslim, in Muslim history. On the third day, the Muslims had achieved a victory against one of the greatest empires in the world and against one of the thrones that was secretly and strongly secured. The standard of Tawheed was raised in the idolatrous land, but the price was steep. Hundreds of martyrs were killed during this battle. Among them was Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. He was found dead on the battlefield, still clutching the flags of the flag of the Muslims. Therefore, the one that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam found at was guaranteed paradise, while the one who was loved in this dunya, who frowned at the thought of being a Muslim, Walid, was the one that was in disgrace and disfigured in. Hellfire. One lesson that we can learn from this is that Walid knew Al Islam and knew the Quran was true, but he was more concerned with the thoughts of people and his own status amongst those people than how Allah Ta'ala saw him and his status with his Lord. Another lesson is that last will be first and the first will be last. Those that we regard lowly in this life, if they are righteous in character, that is what Allah sees. Also, we should seek to help our brothers as a priority over trying to convince others to become our brothers. The frown from Malid was for the people just thinking that he might become a Muslim. The other frown was from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and getting his priorities mixed up. I began this khutbah with Allah's name as Al-Malik, the king. Allah is Malik Ul-Mulk, the king of all kingdoms, the king of kings. Despite what anyone else may say or what they may think about the king of kings, the king of kings that they believe prays to Allah. There are rulers and there are kings of men, and then there are kings of the jungle. I read something about the king of the jungle that gave me the idea for this khutbah. 
it goes like this. In Arabic, Abasa is a word for a lion. But what it literally means is one who frowns. From the word Abasa, meaning to frown. Abbas, I don't know if I said that right correctly. Abbas is the name for the lion. It comes from Abasa, meaning to frown. It is likely a description of how a lion's face looks like a frown. But I think there's more to it than that. There is a sadness in the lion's face that goes beyond its frown. And it's a sadness shared by all who are strong and guard their proverbial prides, be it their families or their faith base or ethnic community. It lies in the problem with always being there for everyone, being strong for everyone, defending them when they are weak, pulling them up out of dark places, inspiring them when they are down, lending an ear when they need someone to hear, lending a shoulder when they need to bury their faces and cry, and being the one who knows what's going on around around them in an extremely terrifying world. The problem is that while you are always there for everyone else, no one is there for you because they think you don't need it. If only they knew how wrong they were. Brothers and sisters, we are all, all in need of the help of Allah. Let us turn to him in need no matter how strong you think you are. You are not stronger than Al than Al Qaw, the strongest one. Khima Salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, falhamati salah, falhamati salah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadar Rasulullah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا صراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Kulu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalit, Balam Yulad, Walam Yakulu, Kufu one Ahad, Allah at God. Semi Allahu Lam in Hamida, Allah at God. Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Malik Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'abudu Wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeen Sirat Al-Adhina An'amta Alayhim Ghayr Al-Majdubi Alayhim Walad-Dolim Amin Qul A'udu Bi Rabbi Al-Nas Malik Al-Nas Ilah Al-Nas من شرير الوسوس يلخن الناس الله بيوسوس في سو في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس الله سمي الله من حمد الله أكبر 
الله أكبر الله الله أكبر الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم Acknowledge Imam Khalil right here. He's in my class, y'all. He's one of my uh, students in my Islamic leadership training and development class. I also wanted you to uh, meet. This is uh, Nabiya's father, and that's her brother right there. Allah 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 Allah. Allah. So the brother who gave that beautiful thing, and that's her brother. You mention that to her. That's her, that's her father right there. Uh, where, where are you traveling from? I'm out of Dothan, Alabama. Alabama. I'm up here uh, this weekend. My family is having a family reunion in uh, Virginia Beach. So, like my wife and I always do, wherever we go someplace, we always try to find out where the master is. So, alhamdulillah. So, I made the request in class the other night and granted the beautiful invitation. Allahu Akbar. Great. Glad to have you here. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Um, also, there is food. Is, so, we only have chicken. Now, chicken is in there that we got. So, please. Grab some, grab a plate and put some on, on your plate if you leave. Um, but make sure you get some before you leave because we, we have an abundance of it there. We don't have sides, so some chips and stuff in there if you want to get that. Take some water at the bottom. Um, for zakat, um, it's dollar sign M-W-S-A-L-A-A-M. Uh, if you want to mail it in, it is 614 West 35th Street, Norfolk, Virginia, 23508. Or you can mail it into the P.O. Box, which is P.O. Box 1802. Norfolk, Virginia, 23501. Uh, we are still collecting money so if you uh, for the uh, acquisition next door. So if you want to oh, notate that on your zakat form or in your um, cash app, you can do so. Uh, inshallah, tomorrow morning I'll be here. And Sunday morning I'll be here for uh, Fajr prayer at 515. Uh, and there will be an Arabic class on um, Sunday at 11 o'clock. There won't be a Talim this um, this Sunday. I have something to do for my class, for this Islamic leadership and training class. Actually, you know, you're supposed to be in there too, right? <laughs> you and I are the last people left. Yes. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll be doing that uh, on that time, inshallah. I just want to remind the people about the food and snacks. There's also a community meeting that will be held on October 8th um, at 1 o'clock. That will be on a Sunday. Um, there are bean pies for sale that is $5.00. Grab those as soon as you can because they quickly leave out of his door. Mm -hmm. The laundry uh, detergent is outside as well. It is Muslim owned and black owned. And those books on the side on the side when you come in are all free. The Qur'ans, the everything. The, uh, if there are pamphlets that you want to give to somebody at your job, alhamdulillah, we keep getting more and more. So grab those, put them in the bathroom somewhere, wherever you uh, feel that you can uh, spread this message. And last but not least, uh, this emergency medical call. You have this? So this is an emergency medical card that we made from our Janazah committee, from the communities around here. It's for, uh, in case of uh, you return to Allah unexpectedly, um, you can have on here your name and it says, basically, I am a Muslim, I request that you respect my religion and do not do an autopsy nor embalm me. Please contact the, my next of kin or notify the nearest mosque or Islamic center. So we have these for all the people that come in here, whether they are visitors or not. Uh, we have a bunch of those right out when you signed in. If you go back to your community and you don't have any, you can take some, we'll get more. So we, uh, we've had issues in the past with Muslims who have returned to Allah and Muslim families not wanting to respect our wishes. And you can put this, whoever the believer is, put it in your wallet. 
and if something happens, then uh, the, the paramedics or whoever it is will see that and um, talk to your next of kin and also talk to the mosque or Islamic center closest to you. Uh, I think that's all I, uh, yes, I'm uh, Sister Jackie. Sister Jackie is doing well. She's still, she's, uh, still recovering. Uh, she's still getting someone else to drive her. That's why you don't see her here. So she's here on the weekends when she's able to get uh, someone to drive her here. But she comes on, she'll be here probably sa Saturday, tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, so she's still here, and Sister Ruth is also uh, helping, assisting with her, with the uh, treasury. Um, so, inshallah, she may have to do surgery, though. She may have to do surgery. That may be what, what the issue is, just if she doesn't recover or more rapidly. But she's doing well. I mean, you can call her. She's still her same self. She'll push you out like, <laughs> just, like, just like any other day. <laughs> All right. Sound like <laughs> Am I lying? That's, she will. That's the truth. That's the truth. Quick. We can quit this. She's going to be mad when she hear that. She's going to bust me out.